Sometimes Yahweh's instructions seem quite ridiculous. Why build a boat to save you from floodwaters when it has never before rained? We're all familiar with Abraham's extreme act of faith that was accounted to him for righteousness. But Noah's obedience to build the ark might be considered the most significant act of faith prior to Abraham. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear and prepared an ark for the saving of his household. Tragically, kept outside the ark were all those who had corrupted their way on the earth. What would have happened had Noah ignored the warning? Would he and his family have perished along with the rest? Of course. Divine instruction did not end with Noah. Many times since, God has reached down and prophetically called the leader to step up with extreme faith to direct or shepherd his people. What happens when man refuses? What is happening right now? What will happen in the future should God's chosen vessels neglect to prepare an ark? And behold, I myself am bringing flood waters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to to faith. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Pray with me. Father, thank you again for another evening where we can come, where we can rest ourselves from our hurried pace of life, where we can allow our spirit to simmer upon you. For us to recognize the words that you are going to speak to us are, are wisdom, that they are to be applicable to our lives, to, to the growth of who we are in order that we may advance your kingdom on planet earth. We can't thank you enough for the uh, part of the economy that you've allowed us to enjoy in your holy and amazing grace. We can't thank you enough for who you are in our lives, for you. Uh, allowing us to represent you day in and day out in every single circumstance that arises in front of our, our very eyes. Forgive us when we pass up an opportunity where a spiritual um, encounter can take place. We know that there are many and they're all surrounding us. So thank you for empowering us with indeed with your Holy Spirit and gifting to us the words to use in each and every circumstance that we can. We praise you. We welcome your spirit here now. Thank you again and again. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Hey, welcome again to another evening here at KEM. Uh, we look forward to hearing Dr. Jeff and the teaching that he's prepared. And as we always do to introduce the ministry, we have uh, four pillars. And as we say all the time, it doesn't, they don't go on any particular uh, importance uh, in, the, in the way that we say them. But today I had a, a very small encounter with a gentleman uh, who immediately this, this situation here just came to, to life and it, it, it just allowed me to rejoice in what we talk about in, in, in this uh, congregation. And the fact was, I have this gentleman that for like the last three weeks, he's, he's been trying to buy this very beat down van that I have at my place of business. And we had agree, agreed upon a price over the phone. And when he came, he tried to change things. And so fast forward the three weeks, he finally agreed to come and, and buy it today. So he comes and he gives me the money and uh, it was $1,200. And uh, he says to me, he says, when, when you make the bill of sale, uh, please make it for like four hundred dollars. And so I looked at him, and I looked at him with a, a face of amazement. I'm, I'm thinking, I'm not, I'm not gonna do that. So I walked away from there, saying, I've already encountered this guy for three weeks over the fact that he didn't want to give me the extra two hundred dollars that we had agreed upon. I know this is gonna be another conversation. So I went in the in the office. And I said, What am I gonna do? So I said, Just give him the eighty-four dollars back for the taxes. Let him pay and let him do whatever he wants with it. So I, I wrote the bill of sale for the $1,200, and I go back out and I said, here, you have $16? And he goes, yes. I said, here's $84, back so that you can pay the taxes. I said, I, said, I happen to be a minister. I said, and it, it would behoove me to put a lie on a piece of paper. He says to me, this is what he says to me, it, it was priceless. He says, I'm a rabbi. <laughs> and I said, I said, you're a rabbi? 
And he goes, he goes, yeah. I said, where are you? He goes, where are you a minister at? I said, I happen to be a minister at a Hebraic root congregation. I said, we, ob we observe Shabbat. As a matter of fact, I said, we're going to meet tonight. As the sun starts to go down, he goes, you work tomorrow? I said, no, I will not be working tomorrow. I said, you remember last, the, the, when you called me, it was on a Saturday. I told, you, I told you I don't talk business on a Saturday. I said, that's the reason why I told you that. Wow. I said, today's teaching just completely rolls right into this conversation that I'm having. Wow. So these little encounters as I was praying, they're all around us. But we have to be cognizant of the words that we have to get to use and how we have to meet them out. Because it could have been very easy for me to put whatever he wanted me to put in the paper. I said, nobody will know, but I will know. God will know. And I can't live life like that. It, to me, it's just not the way that Yeshua wants us to live. And so that leads me right into the, the, uh, uh, the restoration of the authority of the of church. You know, we have the kingship of Yeshua. It flows down to the, uh, to the apostolic. And we, we have the prophetic. And, and not in that order, kingship the, of the Yeshua to the prophetic and to the apostolic. And so we have to recognize that we have that authority to speak into people's life. And the leadership that, that Yeshua has given us should flow through you at any given moment. It, you, you don't have to hide from those things. And so we, we have that as a pillar of our, of our faith. And we have the advancement of the kingdom, as I prayed earlier in, our, in my prayer. We have to recognize that we are, we are an army. We're soldiers. And we have to be able to gather this army to continue to develop the, the growth of the kingdom of God here on planet Earth. Then we have to mature our disciples. As we get here on a Friday evening, every single Friday, we get the opportunity to open up the Word, study it to the depth that Yeshua allows us to understand it, and then grow, and then go ahead and be matured. And then obviously, last but not least, the remembering of our roots. As we're here today, we're, we're, we're remembering the fact that, that Yeshua himself was no more, no more of a Hebrew or Hebrew than anybody else. He was born in that, in that race, and there's a reason for that. And so we have to remember that the Christian that we, the Christianity that we get to enjoy today was uh, birthed out of those Hebraic roots. And so without taking any more of his time, because I know he's probably got a lot to say, Dr. Jeff, come on up here. Thank you, Pastor Manning. Yes, I always have a lot to say. Yes, isn't that an amazing story? You know, uh, so in alignment with today's message, as we venture into the second portion of Genesis uh, chapter 6 verse 9 all the way through 1132 and as you know we always you know are going to extract a piece we can't teach all five chapters today but if you're writing notes I want to tell you this and uh, and why it's so interesting and related to this this little encounter that Manny had with understanding you know somebody who's has to live with integrity has to be a leader in, in the church and this gentleman who's obviously saying he's a leader in, in uh, Judaism. And um, the title of today's message is Tender Branches, The Fate of Two Messengers. And uh, as always, I have a little outline for you for tonight's voyage. I use the word voyage. Why? Because it's the story of Noah today. You know, we, fi we find the encounter with God and Noah and a, and a number of other topics today. But we're going to spend our time focused on Noah. And we're going to look at a world, first of all, and recognize a world filled with irreversible corruption. Number two, we're going to discover Yahweh's ultimate plan to avenge the righteous. Number three, the critical connection between faith and obedience. Number four, the depth of what Yeshua meant by this phrase, tender branches. Number five, the embarrassing failure and necessary replacement of church leadership. So in alignment with what Manny was talking about. Number six, the ultimate separation of light and darkness. And number seven, the inevitable rise of Yahweh's glory in his people and the judgment of evil. And extract that out of these verses that Manny read earlier. Knowing that God called Noah to build an ark. And why he was calling Noah to build the ark. I want to make a special note today and tell you, uh, in today's teaching, there's going to be a lot of reading. Uh, what I tend to do is, before I post the notes online, which are usually fairly lengthy, I include all of the scriptures. And then when I, I go back, usually uh, Wednesday night or Thursday morning, and I, I try to cut the teaching down, I pull the fullness of the scriptures out and I, I leave room for discussion about those verses. And as I was doing that this week, I couldn't help but realize there's no better way to say some of this than to just read the scripture itself. So today, 
unlike some other times, I'm going to spend a lot of time going through, through verses. And, uh, and if you want to follow in your Bible, you should do it. If nothing else, write down the verse references. It's, it's an um, impactful and scary message. Tender branches, the fate of two messengers. And the first thing we're going to talk about today is the preparation of the ark. It's really the foundation of, of everything. And realize why Yahweh called Noah to build an ark. He says this in Genesis 6, 11 to 13. The earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, all, for all the flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them from the face of the earth. This is a horrible moment. This is a horrible moment in history. Every time I outline the Torah portion for the week, I'm always listening to what the Spirit is saying. Like, where are we going to stop? Where are we going to focus this message? That's, that's how I come up with the message. And that verse struck me. And what I want you to kind of keep in the back of your mind as we cycle through today is, what, what hit me was, where are we today in the earth? Could, could this verse be repeated verbatim about today in the earth. He says how he's going to destroy the earth. Of course, he says floodwaters will come and destroy all flesh that has breath of life. And he says that in Genesis 6, 17. Of course, he makes a covenant of safety with, with Noah. He, preser he preserves him because, because of Noah's righteousness. He says, I will establish my covenant with you and you shall go into the ark you and your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And then he says, come into the ark. Noah, it says in, in, in Genesis 6, 8, Noah found grace in the eyes of God. It says in verse 7, 1, Then the Lord said to Noah, come into the ark, you and your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Great testimony for Noah. And of course, you know his seven relatives that come into the ark with him. But every other living creature with breath in its nostrils is going to be left outside the ark. The thing you want to understand about Noah, it, it's very easy to read these stories and say, wow, that was really cool. This guy had an encounter with God and he built this giant boat, right? But Manny read that introduction. It's like, you know, remember it had never rained before. Uh, he didn't know what a flood was. I mean, clearly he knew what water was, but he didn't know what a flood was. And he had to demonstrate unimaginable faith to do this thing. And really, he had no evidence that a boat would ever be needed. No evidence. That's interesting because when you see the scripture that Manny extracted, when I extracted that little verse about, uh, about Noah that, that was in Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter, chapter 11, which is really the hall, of, the hall of faith, the hall of fame of faith chapter. In the first verse it says, now faith is the substance, substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Think of Noah. Without faith, verse 6, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he, he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And then one verse later, he says, by faith, Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen, that very phrase we see in Hebrews, the evidence of things not seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household. That's the substance of things hoped for, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. That's the verse that Manny read earlier in the introduction. One other point of interest, just so you know, Luke, in Luke 3, takes his time out to do the lineage of Messiah and you see, of course, the lineage of Messiah comes through, comes through Noah. Makes sense, right? It would have to. But just so you know, that is, that is a, in, in, in um, Luke chapter 3. Of course, he has to build an ark. Here's the timing of it. Nobody really knows how long it took to build the ark. You've got to imagine, without modern tools and so on and so forth, it took a long time. But we do know the distance between uh, the birth of his sons, the age of Noah when his sons are born, uh, and the age he was when the floods come, right? It's about 100 years. 
He's born, uh, his sons are born when he's 500 years old, Genesis 5.32. And Genesis 6, uh, 7, 6, he's 600 years old when the floods come. We have to assume somewhere between those two events is when he builds, he builds the ark, right? Well, because he had to have sons that are named already, that are bringing into the, to the ark with wives and so on and so forth. So maybe it takes 50, 60 years possibly to build an ark. So we have this quintessential example of faith. He says, make for yourself an ark, and Noah did. Make for yourself an ark, and Noah did. Genesis 6, 14, and, and, uh, and 22. And come into the ark, and Noah did. Now, you ever remember the scene when he says, come in the ark? You know, I have to know that the day he enters the ark is the day the floods come. So had he been told to come into the ark and he dilly-dallied, it would have been bad. So if you just kind of, a, a few times throughout the night, I'm going to ask you to just kind of meditate on these words. Now that you have this picture of Noah in your mind, hear these words of James that connect action to faith. Not a mental ascent, not just oh, I'm, I believe God, but it doesn't produce any, any, any work. James says, I'll read a little excerpts out of James uh, chapter 2. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone has, says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Let's skip ahead. Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works he was made perfect? Faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see, then, that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. That's James 2, 14, 17 to 24, and 26. So I mentioned earlier, it says in Genesis 7, 13 to 16, just a little piece, on the very day the waters came, Noah and his family entered the ark and all the flesh in which is breath of life, and the Lord shut him in. So outside was all the flesh that had breath, and inside was Noah and his seven family members, and the Lord shuts the door of the ark. You can imagine the Lord probably had to do that. Can you imagine the ramp that was created to go up into that ark, how heavy it might have been to, for all these animals to trample over it? Outside the ark... Also, in whose nostrils was breath of the spirit of life, all that was on dry land died. They were destroyed from the old earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. So, let me just review for a moment before we go on. The foundation of this entire message is this preparation of the ark. This faith that caused an action in the earth. The earth was so corrupt and filled with violence that Yahweh was ready to destroy it and its inhabitants with a flood. I want you to think ahead, if you're marking a note, we're going to land here later. In Isaiah 59, the conditions on the earth are described in detail. What I think is the end of the age sounds like exactly what Noah was experiencing before God said the whole earth was corrupt. He sees Noah as righteous and faithful and promises to preserve him and his family. Remember, it says Noah found grace in Yahweh's eyes. And faith is not faith unless it's backed by obedience or action. So Noah is told to make an ark, and he does it. He's told to come into the ark, and he does it. And it takes one, this is a very important prophetic picture. It takes an entire lifespan, seemingly, like a generation or so, to build the ark. Right? Somewhere in this 100-year period, the ark is built. Somewhere between the birth of his children, who are then, of course, grown up and married, right? Um, and 
when the flood comes, 100 years. So maybe they're in their 20s or 30s. So maybe 60, 70 years or whatever it takes. One generation. You need to understand this generation. And then, of course, the day he enters the ark is the day the flood starts. The next section is tender branches. You'll understand where I'm taking that, that phrase from in a moment. When you see these things, when you see these things, maybe write that down if you take notes. When you see these things, when you see these things, what should you be looking for today in the world that would mean when you see these things, as in the days of Noah, the sign of your coming. In the beginning of Matthew 24, the disciples ask Yeshua this question, what is the sign of your coming and the end of the age? When you see these things. And then he gives the parable of the fig tree. In Matthew's gospel, it says this. Now learn the parable from the fig tree when its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves. You know the summer is near. So you also, when you see these things, know that it is near at the doors. I say to you, this generation, this one generation will by no means pass. This generation, kind of like that generation from build an ark, get in the ark. One generation, till all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will by no means pass away. Luke's version which actually talks about the kingdom, uh, says this, but first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation, this one generation. Kind of like that generation that sat outside the ark. And, and we don't know for sure, but you hear a lot, of, oh, they probably mocked him. Maybe they did. There's no record of that. But it's not likely that it was looked upon favorably, this nut job building a boat, saying the flood is coming. Matthew's gospel goes on in, in his rendition. He says, but of that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also were the, was the, will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came that took them all away. They did not know until the flood came. In that moment, in that day, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Luke's version says the same thing. But then Luke adds this. Luke's version adds this. Likewise, as it also was in the days of Lot. Luke expands this teaching to another time in history when man looked really bad. Some really bad things were happening in Sodom and Gomorrah. One chapter later in Luke, that rendition is in Luke 17, this is in Luke 18, then he spoke a parable to them that the men always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, there was this certain city, a certain city, a judge, who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in the city, and, the, and she came to him saying, get justice for me. Mark that down. Get justice for me. Someone get justice for me against my adversaries. And he would not for a while. But afterwards he said within himself, though I do not fear God nor regard man, this is a non-follower of God. It's not a Christian. It's not a, even a, probably a Jew. It's just a, a pagan. Yet, because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. Like even the secular judge brings justice. And, and shall God not avenge his own? Again, I'll refer you to Isaiah 59. The earth looks a certain way. We're going to get there. And it even says, will he find justice in the earth? Is there anyone to institute justice? That's what he says in Isaiah 59 who will cry out day and night to him, though he bear for them long, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. In that moment, in that very day, 
when the ark door closes, you know, in the day that no one knows that you have to be prepared for. Be ready, be watching. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, he will, will he find, will he really find faith in the earth? Those are Luke's words. That's Luke 18, the first eight verses. So now we have the tale of two choices. Both Matthew and Luke use this kind of analogy. It says this in Matthew. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken. One will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken. One will be left. Watch there, for you do not know what hour the Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have been watching and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not expect. Again, Luke's version brings in Lot. He says, in that day he was on the housetop, and his goods are in the house. Let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not go back. Remember Lot's wife? Whoever seeks to save his own life will lose it. Whoever loses his own life will save it. Right? Then he goes on to similar parable, one taken, one left. Same, same kind of language as, as Matthew. And he answered and said to him, Where, Lord? So he said, Wherever the body is, there the eagles will gather also. Maybe meaning vultures. Uh, birds of prey or birds that eat. You know, they, the, the vultures circle when there's a dead body. It's a sign. What's the sign? There's this dead body. That's why, that's why the, vulture, the vultures are there. Right? Meaning, you should be able to see the obvious signs. Of course, in, in Matthew's Gospel, he mentions this, this thief. It says again, if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have been watching. Paul captures that concept in 1 Thessalonians 5. When he says this, but concerning the times and seasons, brethren, see the, the parallels? You have no need that I should write to you, for you yourself know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. For when they say to you, peace and safety, then sudden destruction, sudden destruction. Quick, happens right away. Nobody knows it's happening. Again, note, the flood came the, the, the day the, the, the door was closed. Sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, my brethren, are not in darkness, so the day should overtake you as a thief. You are sons of light. Hold that one in your, hold that one in your spirit. As we, you are sons of light and sons of day. We are not in the night or in the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as the others do, but let us watch and be sober. For you who know the signs, the signs of the time, he doesn't appear like a thief because you're watching, you're paying attention. Of course, the, that rendition of Matthew kind of uh, peaks at the end when he describes the person that's living like this. What does he say? He says, who then is the faithful and wise servant to the master who made ruler of his household to give the people food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom the master, when he comes finds doing so. He describes this entire picture of a faithful, prepared, in Noah's world, he was building an ark. What, are we, what should we be doing? Because the day's coming suddenly. What should we be doing? The person who's doing whatever that thing is, he's called the faithful and wise servant. He's the one that God says, make sure you're like that when I come back. Right? So the tender branches, you should easily notice when the leaves bud on the tree and recognize the season is coming. That's why he says tender branches. Oh yeah, you know, summer's coming. There's a generation between the budding and the fruit. It's important to know that. It would seem that this generation will completely ignore the signs and go on living as if nothing is happening. Hello, take a breath and take a look at the earth today. The predominant nature of what's going on in the earth today is a generation that's ignoring what's going on. Matthew and Luke both use examples to paint a picture of one person being prepared and one person not being prepared. 
They both recall the days of Noah. And of course, Luke adds Lot. They both use this idea of being taken, taken by surprise. And of course, we know from Paul's teaching, you will only be surprised if you're not ready. And then in Paul in 1 Thessalonians, he said, you are sons of light. You know, Christ himself said in the Sermon on the Mount, you are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men. You're not supposed to be in darkness. So this is why he uses this phrase, tender branches. But I added to that the fate of two messengers. Meaning, the branches are tender, and some people are going to notice, and some people aren't going to notice. What I really care about as we, we cycle through this, as we cycle through this, we have a new mic attached to this, and uh, it's vibrating here. It's thunder. It's, uh, well, the thunder's coming in about three to five minutes. The next section is the prophetic word confirmed. I don't think anybody does a better job summing up this entire concept in the New Testament than Peter. Peter references Noah, I think, more than anyone. So let's, let's look a little bit of how Peter leads in and gives us insight into the world that's existing at the time. And by the way, he's, not, he's talking about prophecy. He's not talking about looking backwards. He's look, talking about looking forwards. It says this in 2 Peter 1, 19 to 21. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which we do well to heed as light shines in darkness and dark places until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to please note, you know, I have this, you should have Isaiah 59. We didn't get there yet, but it should be kind of brewing in your mind, Isaiah 59. It describes what's going on in the earth. It describes when God gets fed up. It describes what God is calling us to do. Prior to that, in Isaiah 51 and 52, he's talking about the leadership that's been established amongst his people being silent, missing the mark, not leading, leaving the people without leadership. In Jeremiah, it does the best job describing the very thing that is the opposite of what Peter just said, which was, no prophecy came by personal, it's not, it's not about me. When, when, the, when the priests and the prophets are making stuff up and leading the people astray. Again, I want to call your attention on what's going on in the earth today. First Peter 3, 18 to 22 says this, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited. Mark that down. The divine law, once the divine long-suffering waited. The waiting is the generation spoken about in Matthew. It's the generation spoken about in Luke. It's the generation spoken about in Genesis between the birth of Noah's sons and the flood. He says, when the divine, when the once divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water, there is also an antitype. It's a fancy phrase which now saves us. Baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but, but of an answer of a good conscience towards God. What is an antitype? It's a curious concept. An antitype is the opposite of something representative of, it's a symbol that's exactly the opposite trying to present something that's the same. What, what do I mean by that? 
It's a predictive pattern or image of the opposite that's so certain and representative of the thing resembling its counterpart that you know exactly what it's talking about. The water of the flood killed the earth. The water of baptism saved the earth. It's an, their antitype. It's an antitype. It's the exact opposite trying to tell you the same message. So he says that. Remember, both, and Peter and Luke both uh, refer to Noah and Lot. So this is what Peter says in 2 Peter, uh, 2 Peter 2, 4 to 11. I'm going to read this slowly. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and deliver them to the chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of the eight, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them to destruction. Why? Making them an example to those who would after live ungodly lives. I draw your attention to the world again today. Example of those who would live ungodly lives. This is the thing that we need to be looking at right now. And delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. We'll see that again in Isaiah 59. For that a righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day and night by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the ungodly out of temptations. We'll see this in Isaiah 59. And to reserve, I mean the godly out of temptations, to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment and especially those who walk according to the flesh and the lust and uncleanness and, and those who despise authority. Again, we'll see that exact thing going on in Isaiah 59. Listen to this phrase. And think about what you're seeing today in the news. Think about what's going on. The date today is the 23rd of October, 2020. We are about 11 days before the next presidential election in the United States. Think about what you're seeing today. And listen to this phrase from Peter. They are presumptuous, self-willed, not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries, whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring reviling accusations against them before God. The evil in the earth has risen to a point well, they would speak against God's people so, in such a self-willed, presumptuous way with zero fear of God in a way that not even angels would do. Can you see this spirit in operation in the earth today? It's arrogant, presumptuous, dismissive of truth. They have zero fear of speaking out against God for his, or his ambassadors. Is this not exact spirit and operation in the earth right now? Yeah. Tell me you can't recognize it. Second oh, yeah. Peter 3, 1-7. Peter does such a great job. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, and both of which I stir up your pure minds by the way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and our Savior, knowing this, that scoffers will come in the last days. Again, I'll refer you to Isaiah 59. Walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers have slept, all things continue. They were from the beginning of, as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in water, referring to the flood, by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by God's word, by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So we see in Isaiah, who actually also mentions Noah in Isaiah 54, as, the, as we, we get to a section called The Prophets Arise, says this, for a mere moment I have forsaken you. 
You're going to see this in the beginning of Isaiah 59. But with great mercies I will gather you. With a little wrath I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. For this is like the waters of Noah to me. For I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth. So I've sworn that I would not be angry with you nor rebuke you. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed. But my kindness shall not depart from you, nor shall my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has mercy on you. He's telling us that in the midst of this moment, when the earth has reached this thing again, I'm not going to use a flood, but I am going to remember my righteous, like Noah. So this section I want to, I want to call failed leadership. And where do we stand today? Remember, no prophecy. This is Peter, right? 2 Peter 1, 20 to 21. No prophecy of Scripture is of private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but by holy men of God who spoke when they were moved by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to read you Isaiah 51, 17 to 23. I told you I'm going to do a lot of... I can't describe it any better than reading it. God's... God's people, the backstory here is God's people being afflicted by evil. Sound familiar? There's no one to guide her among all the sons I brought forth, nor is there anyone who takes her by the hand among the sons that she brought forth. These two things have come to you. Who will be sorry for you, desolation and destruction, famine and sword? By whom will I comfort you? Your sons have fainted. They lie at the head of the streets like an antelope in a net. net. They, who is he talking about? His appointed neg negligent leaders, those that he raised up to protect his people when evil arose in the earth. He says, they are full of fury of the Lord, the rebuke of God. God is pissed at them. He's angry that they failed to step in and do what Noah did. What did Noah do? He heard, he obeyed. Come in, he went in. He didn't neglect the calling, even though there was a hundred years. Therefore, please hear this, you afflicted. Now he's addressing the people that are being abused because the leaders failed. Therefore, please hear this, you afflicted and drunk, but not with wine. Thus says the Lord, the Lord of your God, who pleads the cause of his people. See, I have taken out of your hand the cup of trembling, the dregs of the cup of my fury. You shall no longer drink it, but I will put it into the hand of those who afflict you, who have said to you, lie down that we may walk over you. That's what will be. Lie down. Let us just walk over you. And you have laid your body like on the ground as on the street for those to walk over. I want to refer you to, you can read the whole chapter, Jeremiah 23, but listen to how it starts out. Talking about failed leadership. Woe to you shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel against the shepherds who feed my people. You have scattered my flock, driven them away, and not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for the evil of your doings. Is this not exactly what's going on in the church today? Yes. Scattered all over. Don't come to church. Be afraid. Don't come to church. Be submissive to, submissive to evil. Stay home. Scatter. I have nothing to offer you. But I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I've driven them and bring them back to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase, and I will set up new shepherds over them. Who will feed them? And they shall feel no more, nor be dismayed, nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. That's the first four verses of a Jeremiah 23. If we skip down to verse 9, it gets uglier. My heart within me is broken because of my prophets. All of my bones shake. I'm like a drunken man, and, I, and, and like a man whom wine is overcome because of the Lord and because of his holy words from for the land is full of adulterers. For because of the curse of the land, because of their curse, the land mourns. The pleasant places of the wilderness are dried up. The course of life is evil. 
and their might is not right, for both the prophet and the priest have become profane. Yes, in my house I have found their wickedness, says the Lord. Therefore their way shall be to them like slippery ways. In their darkness they should be like driven and uh, be driven on, on and fall in them. For I will bring disaster on them the year of their punishment, says the Lord. And I have seen the folly of my prophets in Samaria and prophesied, they prophesied by Baal and caused my people of Israel to err. Also I have seen the horrible thing in the prophets of Jerusalem. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They also strengthen the hands of evildoers so that no one turns back from wickedness. All of them are like Sodom to me and inhabitants like Gomorrah. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, Behold, I will feed them wormwood and make them drink the water of gall. For the prophets of Jerusalem, profaneness has gone out, of the land, out into all the land. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you. They make you worthless. They speak a vision from their own heart, not from the mouth of the Lord. They continually say to those who despise me, the Lord has said, you shall have peace. And everyone who walks according to the dictates of his own heart, his own heart, they shall say, no evil will come upon you. Isaiah 52, after this piece of Isaiah 51, where the sons, the leaders have failed, Isaiah 52 begins with this. Awake, awake. Put on your strength. It goes on to say, For the uncircumcised and the unclean shall no longer come to you. Shake yourself from the dust. Loose yourself from the bonds of your neck. You have sold yourself for nothing. Christians, you have sold yourself for nothing. Those who rule over them wail, says the Lord, and my name is blasphemy continually every day. I believe in God. I believe in God. I abort children, but I believe in God. My name is blasphemed in the earth. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Your watchmen shall lift up their voices. I think that's what's happening here. The Lord has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of God. Depart, depart. Go out from there. Touch no unclean thing. Go out from the midst of her. Be clean, you who, hear, you who bear the vessels of the Lord. For you shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight. For the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel shall be your real guard. So as we, as we start to wind down, I want to land in the place I've been referring to all night. Isaiah 59. It's a horrifying depiction of what's going on in the earth. And I think when I read this, if you close your eyes and imagine the news, imagine the reports, imagine uh, what you're seeing everywhere in the United States right now, and kind of think, this is probably what it was like in Noah's day, their, their version of, of what we see today. I'm going to read the first, I'm going to start in verse 1. I want you to remember that when God talked about Noah, he said the earth was filled with corruption and violence. The earth was filled with corruption and violence. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, nor is, or, nor is hear, his ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear for your hands are defiled with blood, your fingers with iniquity, your lips have spoken lies, your tongue have muttered perversity. No one calls for justice. This justice thing is going to come up multiple times. Is that not today? Nor does anyone plead for truth. They trust in empty words and speak lies. They conceive evil and bring forth iniquity. They hatch viper's eggs and weave a spider's web. He who eats of their eggs dies, and from that which is crushed, the viper breaks out. Their webs will, be, will not become garments, nor will they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity, 
and the act of violence is in their hand. They, their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their path. The way of peace they have not known, and there is no justice in their ways. They have made themselves crooked paths. Whoever takes that way shall not know peace. Therefore, justice is far from us, nor does righteousness overtake us. We look for light, but there's only darkness. For brightness, but we walk in blackness. We grope for the wall like a blind man, and we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday, and as at twilight, we are as dead man in desolate places. We all growl like bears and moan sadly like doves. We look for justice, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before us, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and our iniquities, and, for our, and as for our iniquities, we know them. In transgression and lying against the Lord, and departing from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood, That's the party line, right there. Justice is turned back and righteousness stands far off. For truth is fallen in the street and, e and equity cannot enter, so truth fails. And anyone who departs, departs from evil makes himself a prey. Then the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. At this point... In verse 15, Isaiah 59 turns. People, this is the moment we have to declare into the earth right now. We must take on this mantle right now. Then the Lord saw, the Lord knows how to deliver the ungodly out of temptations and reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness, despise authority. This is 2 Peter. Listen to this. They, they are presumptuous and self-willed. They are not afraid and speak evil of dignitaries. I just described that. They have no care for what God thinks. They are so bold and presumptuous, they would curse God openly. So Isaiah turns and starts describing when the glorious light comes on God's people and they now start taking on. Remember, he's got to do this through a new breed. Like the old guard, they failed. They failed. They let the church scatter. They let his people become corrupt. They let his people become uh, uh, oppressed. Verse 16 plus, he saw that there was no man and wondered why there was no intercession. Therefore, his own arm brought forth salvation, and in his own righteousness it, it sustained him. For he put on, a righteous, on, on the righteousness as a breastplate, and the helmet of salvation on his head, and he put on garments of vengeance for clothing, and he was clad with zeal as a cloak, according to their deeds, and accordingly he will repay. Fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, the coastlands he will repay fully. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the, enemy of the, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. That's Isaiah 59, 16 and on. We'll skip ahead to five verses in Isaiah 60. And if you would, take your eyes off your Bible for the moment. And, and, and just kind of settle yourself in a place, place of meditation. I'm going to read a few verses you've heard from me many times before, before I get to this Isaiah 60. This is Paul's words in Romans 8. For I consider, now this is going to make a lot of sense. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. 
For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, because of him, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. That's what the earth is waiting for. That's what I, I believe this picture of Isaiah 59, this disgusting, corrupted creation, falling to worse than Noah's time, worse than Sodom and Gomorrah, mocking God in a way that they have no respect at all. They don't think anything's going to happen openly on television, on social media, anywhere. And then he says this. So close your eyes for me. It's Isaiah 60, first five verses. Arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light and the kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your son shall come from afar. Your daughter shall be nursed at your side. Then you shall see and become radiant and your heart shall swell with joy because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you and the wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. We must take on this mandate in the earth. We must step into this now. We must. If you can't see this, this theme of a world filled with corruption and darkness and violence right before you, a world so bold and presumptuous and evil that it would curse God and lie about God openly in the earth, and a church that's scattered, silent, hiding, submissive to evil in the earth. So we saw today a world filled with irreversible corruption. We saw Yahweh's ultimate plan to avenge the righteous. We witnessed the critical connection between faith and obedience. We learned what Yeshua meant by tender branches. We exposed the embarrassing failure and necessary replacement of church leadership. And we explored the ultimate separation of light and darkness. And finally, we embraced the inevitable rise of Yahweh's glory in his people and the ultimate judgment of evil. Who of you wants to sign up for this program. Arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Father, we come before you tonight. Not an easy word. We're desperate for change. Uh, we, we see a world filled with darkness. Lies on the world stage. Corruption all around us. Truth being exchanged for lies everywhere and not a single ounce of fear of you when they do it. Father, let your new, your remnant arise in the earth, a new, shining, bright church filled with boldness and truth to combat this corruption in the earth. Let us see the days approaching as if tender branches in the mighty, mighty name of Yeshua. Amen and amen. All right, thank you, everybody. We'll see you next week.